morning everybody happy science saturday i am so excited weird right you guys would hardly believe it um today is going to be amazing phenomenal ground breaking because this is the first time science saturday has done so many things first of all this is the first time science saturday has been on a boat um, we're on a boat. I'm not going to move the camera because as you can see, I'm not just holding my cell phone in front of me today. Um, the camera is up on a tripod, but we're on a boat at the University of the Virgin Islands and we are going to be going diving underwater with comm systems talking about seagrass. It's going to be amazing. So because this is such a groundbreaking day, I want to say thank you to a few people get this out of the way. Um, Community Foundation of the Virgin Islands has been amazing and purchased so much equipment for Science Saturday. Uh, the equipment that we're taking underwater, uh, the GoPro, the gigantic long 50 foot cord, all of our equipment, um, it's really amazing. I've got a phenomenal team with me today. Uh, behind the scenes, our favorite scientist Joe is hiding uh, with the surface, but he's the one who's making all of this happen. Our UVI team, who you're gonna meet in a second, and of course, my favorite Science Saturday intern, Bush. Say hey, Mason. So, today we are talking about seagrass, and I would like to introduce, as I step back to my mark, Look how fancy we are. We have marks. Look how fancy we are. Hey. hey guys. So, hey Selfie. Hey, hey. hey what are we going to talk about today and who are you? So, we're talking all about seagrass. It's going to be a day full of awesome seagrass. Again, my name's Sophie Costa. I'm a master's candidate here at the University of the Virgin Islands. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited. It's going to cool. be awesome. Awesome. So, what is seagrass? Good question. So seagrass in general, I think it's a little bit underrated. A lot of people typically think of seagrass and think, ah, whatever, it's another grass, you know? But it's not as cool as coral reefs. You don't necessarily see as many fish all the time. Mason, what do you think about seagrass versus coral reefs? I think that seagrass is very nice. Yeah. And Yeah, definitely. Have you definitely? I mean, yeah. in my lifetime, Kitty, you could probably also speak to this. Seagrass is definitely becoming less and less. I would say, um, like the the number of seagrass that we had probably when you were growing up versus now is very different. So nice observation, Mason. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so seagrass in general is an underwater flowering plant. So a lot of them actually you can see their flowers. Um, and here in the Virgin Islands, we have three major ones that you see pretty often, which are Thalassia testudinium, which is commonly known as turtle grass. Easier to say, Definitely. but we're going to try. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Can we just say Thalassia? Yeah, that's okay, perfect. Cool, Thalassia. The Got next it. one is Serangodium filiforme. Okay. You, Serangodium, how does that work? Serangodium. There you go, nailed it. There's also, um, the common name for that one is manatee grass. Ooh. Oh. You have something that's um, like exciting for you? Somebody oh. just loves manatee. Oh, okay. Yeah. Awesome. So the, hopefully we'll see some of that today. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll give you a little shout out. The Serangodium, not the manatees. Yeah, not the manatees. Sorry, Mason. <laughs> and then our um, third one that's really common is Halliduli writing, which is also called shoal grass. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay, yeah. let me compose myself. You got it, Kitty. Howdy Doody Riley. <laughs> yeah, close enough. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, so that one's our shoal grass. That uh -huh. one's typically found in like much shallower waters, so it's not seen. But okay. here we are at Beautiful Brewers, and so right when you step off the beach, that's going to be some of your first seagrass that you're going to see. But it's not as common, so okay. you might not see it. It might not be as obvious. Okay. But in 2002, a non-native um, seagrass arrived here from the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. which it had it previously invaded from the Red Sea after the opening of the Suez Canal. And so that seagrass is called Halophila stupulaceae. Halophila. Oh, yes. As I go. like to call it falafel grass. Yeah, there you go. Because Falaf as you guys know, I'm always hungry. <laughs> um, so all these delicious howdy doody falafel grass. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, call it whichever I'll, one you I'll want. Get it. Yeah. The don't, falafel grass. Don't hate me, scientist friends. <laughs> 
<laughs> Don't worry, you're good, kidding. Uh, well, like I said, arrived in the Caribbean off the coast of Grenada in 2002, and then has spread pretty rapidly and arrived here in St. Thomas in 2013. And so since then, it definitely has become the most abundant seagrass that we see. Here in Brewers, I would say about 90% of the seagrass that you see is actually Halophila. Um, so it's super competitive with our native species. But some studies are also showing that it might be a pioneer species. So, Mason, do you know what a pioneer species is? No? Okay. So a pioneer species is basically after there's like a big destructive event that happens, like say a hurricane, um, the pioneer species will be the first to capitalize on the empty land basically. But what that allows is for other seagrasses to move in. Um, and so that's sort of what we're seeing here in Brewers is after Irma and Maria, the bay was basically white. A lot of the bay was white clean. So Halophila came in, capitalized on that um, open so land, mm -hmm. and then now we're seeing some Serengodium start to come back. Okay, so that's really good news that the native species are coming back. Yes. Because I know just in my you know peripheral paying attention to the really smart scientists I know, <laughs> uh, there was concern that the Halophila was see how carefully I said that, the Halafala uh, was going to just come in and take over everything and right. crowd out the native. So that's super cool and I'm really happy to hear that. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, it'll just be over time we'll be able to yeah, tell a little bit more about the competition between the native and the non-native. Um, yeah, one of the students here at UBI just did a study on that. So hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, but also on that topic, Halophila is also, it does provide some benefits. So one of the students that just actually defended yesterday, Kelsey Vaughn, saw that Halophila is, yeah, congrats Kels, um, actually does carbon sink as well. So as far as global climate change, Halophila is found in areas that might just have had sand, um, and so Halophila does allow, like basically it takes carbon in out of the environment, which okay. is great news. That is. So I was about to ask you what that means, but um, you said it. Yeah. So, awesome. And you have some examples of these grasses. I do have right? some examples, yes. All right, let's so, see. So, I do have some examples. Halophila. Right, so is a bit different from our other native seagrasses. So here we have three um, of our native seagrass, or three seagrasses, two native and the Halophila. Okay. So Mason, can everyone see this? Yeah, I'm you can see it, it Joe? Mm -hmm. Okay. So Mason, can you tell me what's the like major difference you see between these three? Just right off the bat. Well, first of all, I see that this one right it's more like real grass. Okay. And this one is more like a vine, uh -huh. and this one is more like pine needle. So yeah, like that for that sure. Pine wow, your descriptions are awesome. Yeah, Good job, sure. bud. <laughs> so this one is actually. See, one root has many different um, leaves on it and rhizomes on it. So this sort of shows. Great question. Should I know that? I because feel like I'm an adult who went to school. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Mason, do you know what a rhizome is? I do not think so. It's okay. the base of a grass that okay. allows it to bloom. Okay, cool. Yeah. Perfect. I probably there's a much better scientific term, um, but we're just gonna stick with that. Put it in the comments later. There There's you go. On, on this one. Down there. Yeah. So you can sort of see the rhizome on this one. So it's the base of the plant and then the roots come off of it. So here, if you can see, here's the rhizome and then the roots coming down. So you can also, I, this doesn't have as far as the roots extend. Um, so this one is our turtle grass, our Lassia. So you can see the blade length also is quite different. So our Halophila on average is reaching like five to six centimeters in blade length, which is maybe about three inches mm -hmm. versus our turtle grass, which can reach um, up to almost 30, 30 centimeters, which is about 12 inches or a foot. Ah. Is it called turtle grass because turtles eat it? Yes, exactly. So turtles, you'll often see munching on this as well as Serengodium. 
but some people are starting to see turtles munch on the halophila as well. But fish also eat a lot of seagrass, or they'll eat um, what are called epiphytes, which are a food source for fish as well. And so they'll pick those off of the seagrass blades as well. Yeah. Um, oh. So, yeah, one major difference is the height between them. The other yeah. one, as you can see, is the rooting system. So Thalassia is a deep-rooted plant. Mm -hmm. Same with Syringodium. It's not quite as deep as you'll see with the Thalassia, but it is more deep. But then Halophila is very shallow-rooted. So honestly, I then much more than this. Mm -hmm. So that's another reason that scientists think that it might be more of a pioneer species. So that adaptation or that um, ability and characteristic allows it to spread much quicker and then um, take over much more area. All right. Yeah. So I bet those longer roots help hold the sand still too. Definitely. So preventing, what would you think? Um, okay, so last year, actually almost exactly a year ago, Kayla did a Science Saturday on erosion. Um, but it's not erosion in the water, it's like sand movement, right? Yeah, yeah. But super similar um, theory. Now right. that I'm thinking about it, so go back and watch Kayla's Science Saturday yes. from last year where we learned about how the roots of plants on land will protect the erosion. And so in the ocean, the seagrass is protecting the sand. And holding exactly, it still. which all helps our coastal systems. Exactly. And especially, you know, preventing erosion along coastal lines, um, seagrass, you know, is really beneficial in a lot of ways. And I, like I said, I think it's not, there's a lot of misconceptions and people think that it might just be us, but it actually provides a lot for us. Um, I know that the native seagrasses as well also act as carbon sinks. And so that helps, you know, again, take carbon out of the environment. Mm -hmm. And so helping with global climate change and yeah, all sorts of good stuff. Cool. And what are the little purplish brown specks? So those are the sort of the epiphytes. Oh, cool. Yeah, that um, yeah, fish might eat off. The I'm gonna show. Yeah. We'll put them right against the camera so you can see it. Yeah. Where? <laughs> the lens there. <laughs> there you go. Can you see those? Let's see. Yeah, we can just, just barely pull them back. Just very a little bit. Intense. Yeah. <laughs> a super close up. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Ooh. Yeah. Future Science Saturday microscope with seagrass. Ooh, yes, that would be we awesome. We have microscopes. Thanks, Yay. <laughs> um, so for my study, I'm also looking at how the change in seagrass, or how the non-native seagrass, Halophila, uh -huh. is different than um, the native seagrasses. So more particularly, looking at fish. So looking at fish communities, because I bet a lot of you didn't know that seagrass is one of the most important habitats for many fish species. Yes, shocking, I know. So it, it actually provides a nursery habitat. Ooh, I have heard of that. Yes. So, I like to snorkel in seagrass and look for a little fish. Yeah. Maybe we'll see some today. I hope so. I hope we see some babies today because that's the most fun. What kind of fish? Oh, good question, Joe. Joe just asked what kind of fish we see. All sorts of um, wrasses. So if you know your clown wrasse, you might see some, but mainly we're going to see um, the uh, slippery dick uh -huh. and the uh, juvenile snapper and um, a lot of gobies like the bridal goby complex so hopefully we'll check out some today and we can point some out yeah and then um, so it provides important nursery habitat so for my study what we looked at is actually settlement of juvenile yellowtail snapper so Mason do you know what it is settlement pulses no? Okay, so basically what happens is after fish spawn, then they release their eggs into the ocean, right? And then the eggs stay in their little um, larvae form until about 30 days after, and then they'll settle on, it depends on either mangroves, seagrass, or coral reef. So juvenile yellowtail snapper prefer seagrass habitat. So what my study is looking at is to see if there's a difference between the amount of individuals that settle between the Lassia syringodium and Halophila, which is now on Kitty's hat, and um, to see, you know. My sister's hat, actually. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, sister. <laughs>
certain amount that settle, and then we're looking at mortality rate as well. So after settlement, if more die off quicker in the Holophila versus the native seagrasses. And then the third aspect we're looking at is looking at the health of the juvenile yellow tail snapper between different seagrasses. It's important. Definitely. So seeing if there's the same food availability, seeing um, if the length and the width are the same between individuals caught in each of the different types of seagrass. So all good things, you know, mm -hmm. we're trying to see if how it's really impacting um, the fish community. Awesome. That yeah. sounds really cool. Definitely. All right. Any questions from the audience or from you guys? We do have a couple of hellos. Yay. Hey. Hello. Everybody. Um, Don Edwards. Hey, and Daddy. Susan Edwards have both hey, said mommy. hello. Aw. It's a family affair. Yeah, we yeah. love it. They're just here for smush. Yeah, let's be honest. So are we. <laughs> well, I think. Are we ready? Are well, we so ready what, to go diving? So let's go see it up close and personal. You yeah, know? So, definitely. So we be working with. Yeah. So we. Go for oh, it, oh man! All I your cigarettes is falling off your sister's hat. <laughs> we are going to be diving today in some really really cool gear. Um, we have thanks to. Jason, my boyfriend, uh, are full face masks that are attached to a comm system. So Sophie and I are going to be wearing these as our masks and the regulator clicks in and we will be talking between ourselves and also Kayla who's up top with the headgear oh. on um, and you guys will be able to hear all of us and ask questions. Uh, so this is really exciting and groundbreaking. So we're gonna get geared up and Joe's gonna take the camera off of us so that you don't see me flailing around, putting my dive gear on, um, acting ridiculous, and we'll see you underwater. So let's bring this over. So Kayla, you're gonna be operating the nerve center here, right? Yeah, that's right, Joe. So we have we have a number of audience members and I'm gonna be helping out as, as a a number of audience members who are going to want to be asking questions, right? Exactly. So I've got Joe over here who's going to be helping me out, relaying your questions, and then using this whole apparatus that I've got on my head, I'm going to be asking those questions of the divers in real time as they're swimming around with the camera so you guys can see what they're doing, ask questions live, and then I will relay those to the divers and we'll get answers in real time instead of having to wait for them to come up out of the water and ask the questions later. So I also have my handy dandy cell phone where I can see all, everything you guys type. So feel free to just add questions in live as they occur to you and I'll keep an eye on that. So what are they gonna be going out and looking for? They're gonna be going out and looking for two different seagrass types. First, they're gonna look for Holophila stipulaceae. Uh, which is the non-native one that Sophie introduced you guys to. And they're also going to see if they can find some Serengodium filciforme, which is also known as manatee grass, which I think is probably Mason's favorite grass at this point. He's looking really excited. He's also going to be up here helping me keep track of all the cords and everything, because as you can imagine, with all this gear set up, we've got dive gear, we've got camera gear, there's a lot of stuff on the ground on this boat, on the deck, lots of stuff to trip over. So he's going to be managing all our cords, he's going to be feeding out line to our divers so that they don't get their camera hung up on anything. Um, and it's a really, really important job as far as safety wise, so we're really happy to have him here helping us out. Aw, oh, thanks Kelsey, glad to see that you're tuning in. I hope you heard that shout out later, but just in case you didn't, we all say congrats on defending your thesis. On seagrass. On seagrass. Our expert tuning in to our live. Uh, so be ready to, we'll be ready for your questions as well. We'll try to, try to be prepared. And we have another seagrass thesis. Right. On Wednesday. right, we do have another seagrass thesis coming up on Wednesday at UVI. So lots of seagrass stuff is happening. Stay tuned um, if you're interested. And yeah, we are we're ready to field all your questions. I know one question come up while you, while everyone was talking. They talked about epiphytes. Wonder if any of you guys know what 
an epiphyte is. I know some of you do. Um, but those were those little things that Mason found on one of the seagrass. You guys got a really close up look at those. Epiphytes actually exist both underwater and on land. And they're plants that grow on other plants. And so that's what some things feed on on the seagrass. And they're looking for these teeny tiny little other plants that grow on the seagrass underwater. Some common epiphytes on land are orchids. They're plants that grow on trees, right? Also, you might see, um, let's see, what people, some people call air plants. And those will also grow on trees. Epiphytes tend to get a lot of their nutrients and their moisture from the environment around them. So they'll get pull a lot of moisture from the air and they'll pull a lot like nutrients from the surface of the tree itself. All right, we've got our divers getting ready. I don't know if we have our, it doesn't look like we have our GoPro set up just yet, but our divers are getting ready to get in the water. Hi, Jason. It looks like we have Jason watching from another boat <laughs> as we do Science Saturday on this boat. All right, here we go. small step for divers, one big step for Science Saturday. Good. Once you hold the camera, Mason, just watch this board. Alright, here we go. And ready? Alright, we've got Kitty on the dive cam. You're coming in loud and clear. Thank <laughs> you. 
guys, we've actually lost video. Can you return to the dock and we will make sure it's working right and then you can head back out. Please return to the dock, we're having some video issues. Now you get to see my face. <laughs> All right, now on to the good stuff. Just real easy. All right, here we go again. Just go slow. 